Hi there, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Iverson. This week, I'm joined by two National Post colleagues, Adam Zivo and Sabrina Maddo. Welcome both to both of you. Thanks easily the us. most, easily the most uh, telegenic panel we have. But uh, the comp- when the competition is Terry Glavin and Andrew Balfour, not hard competition. So, um, but also terrific journalists. And this week, we're going to start off uh, uh, talking about Adams long piece that was in the post this week, uh, a terrific investigation into the safer supply of drugs uh, that, were, that are aimed at easing the opioid crisis, but which, Adam, which your research suggests are simply subsidizing the use of fentanyl. It, it was a long piece. It involved months of research, dozens of interviews, but I wonder if you can sum it up for us in a few, couple of minutes. Well, so Safer Supply is a strategy that aims to reduce overdoses and deaths by providing government-funded opioids and other sort of government-provided drugs as an alternative to illicit substances. The idea is that if you buy something on the street, you don't exactly know what's in it, so there's a lot of risk involved. It could contain uh, other kind of adulterants or fentanyl that could kill you. So the government wants to just give you uh, its own supply of drugs to keep you safe. Uh, The problem, though, is that hydromorphone, which is the opioid which is primarily distributed through safer supply, uh, while as powerful as heroin, it doesn't really compare to fentanyl. Uh, Its effect relative to fentanyl is like holding a candle to the sun. And so fentanyl users find that it just doesn't get them high, it doesn't overcome their high tolerance, so they take their safer supply hydromorphone and they sell it on the street at rock bottom prices to make money to buy more illicit fentanyl. So in that way, Safer Supply isn't mitigating illicit fentanyl consumption, it's actually subsidizing it. Now, I mean, that, sec- that, that, that must be the acid test. I mean, that's a, probably the wrong use of words, but, but the fact that the price of uh, the Safer Supply drug has fallen so dramatically because there's a much greater increase of supply should be a uh, klaxon going off for the government, no? Well, well, that's the thing is that I, I contacted the government and they don't seem to be tracking this. And there seems to be a egregious lack of accountability here. Uh, Health Canada seems to have almost no strategy in place to deal with opioid diversion. Uh, diversion is a technical term for selling on the black market here. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, in cities where safer supply is available, uh, addiction physicians allege that the price of hydromorphone on the street has gone down between 70 to 95 percent. And that's a pretty concrete indicator that something is amiss and that there's a flood of black market supply. Um, Many people, safer supply advocates, have responded to my piece by saying that the evidence is anecdotal. But when you look at street prices, that's a pretty strong systemic indicator that gives a... Just on that, Adam, I mean, anecdotal, but it seemed almost unanimous among the frontline people you spoke to that while in theory this might be a good idea, in practice it wasn't working. That's the thing, right? So I interviewed 20 medical professionals and 14 addiction medicine practitioners. Uh, Since my piece came out, about seven, sorry, three or four uh, reached out to me on top of that. And all of them unanimously said that there was something terribly amiss with Safer Supply. Unfortunately, these people aren't being listened to because Safer Supply advocates tend to bully addiction physicians into silence. If you criticize Safer Supply, your professional career could go down the toilet, your reputation could go down the toilet. One of my interviewees, for example, was a addiction physician who, was, who worked at a BC Institute associated with Safer Supply. I can't give more details because that person was off the record. But when they raised questions about Safer Supply and volunteered to crunch the Institute's data to check for negative outcomes, they were essentially threatened with their job. And eventually they had to find a job elsewhere. Uh, which is pretty terrifying, I think. Yeah. So, Sabrina, this has now moved into the political realm. After Adam published in the Post on, I think, Tuesday, uh, it uh, was picked up in question period by Pierre Poiliev, uh, asking the, the obvious questions. I mean, Adam's piece suggests Health Canada has identified uh, some of the problems with it, with the government's position, that, that fentanyl users don't get high enough. Um, and yet the Prime Minister's response dismissed it, said it's, Pierre's points might be good for bumper stickers, but it, that it was ideological fear mongering. Um, the, the government minister responsible, Carolyn Bennett, was also uh, dismissive, uh, saying harm reduction measures like this save lives. I mean, it would seem to me that the ideological 
blinkers are on the government rather than on the opposition in this. Yeah, it certainly seems so. Uh, and we see this over and over again with the Trudeau government, uh, whether it's it was their denial of the housing crisis, uh, whether it was their denial of issues with their gun control platform, whether it was denial of issues with uh, Chinese election interference. Uh, they simply do not like to consider facts that do not align with their ideology and the uh, myths that they've created around certain issues. And unfortunately, this is another problem where it has life and death consequences. Uh, but because it doesn't fall in line with what they've been telling the public this entire time, they're simply not willing, it seems, to consider evidence to the contrary. Well, Adam, I hope you keep on this because it does seem to be a, a, a rich vein of, of stuff which maybe will force the government to, to have a rethink at some point. I, hope, I wonder if we can turn now to the, to the foreign interference issue, um, which got a new uh, fresh legs with the revelation that Michael Chong, Michael Chong's family had, uh, had been intimidated or threatened. Uh, CeCe's had known about it, had passed that information up the line, and yet Chong wasn't warned. Uh, two years later, now the government's trying to make amends, I guess. But, but it does seem like this has resonated with the public. Certainly there was a Nanos poll uh, this week which had the Conservatives opening a sizable lead on the Liberals, 35% to 27%. And that's a rolling four-week poll, which suggests that was a pretty large dip in the last 10 days. Um, I guess it can be dismissed as just being one poll, but it, it seems to me it's been vindicated by the Liberals' behaviour, which, whenever they're in trouble, they generally uh, reach for the channel change and bring up the abortion issue. And on, on, uh, on his way into caucus on Wednesday, Justin Trudeau offered the unbidden opinion that the Conservatives were reopening the debate on abortion, uh, and we're going after a woman's right to choose. So back to you, Sabrina. Uh, do you think this, the, the, the Chong revelations have taken this to another level? I believe so. Like you said, we're starting to see some, what it looks like, major swings in polling. And what happened with the Chong revelations is that made it personal. Uh, people really respond to stories when they can attach a human impact to an issue. Whereas before, I think for a lot of the public, the Beijing interference was more theoretical. It was something very political that they just weren't tuned into on a daily basis, like a lot of us who work in the field are. But now that we can see human impacts, and Michael Chong is a very, very um, sympathetic character. He's you know, one of our best parliamentarians who obviously cares so much about doing good for the country, whether you agree with his politics or not. Um, he's admired on both sides of the aisle, and the fact that his family was being threatened and he wasn't even told about that, people can relate about it, and I think they're angry on his behalf. Adam, opposition parties often despair that uh, nothing percolates through to voters. The public basically just doesn't care about politics. I think my experience suggests that they don't care until they do, and then suddenly an issue comes up which which uh, means that the accumulation of all the, the BS in previous years uh, is suddenly crystallised into a feeling of kick the bums out. Um, it happened to Stephen Harper in 2015. Do you think this issue is that issue, the catalyst to uh, a more permanent change in the public mood? I mean, I wouldn't be qualified to say going forward, but looking at the polling data, it certainly made an impact unlike any previous scandal. Uh, going back to what Sabrina said, there's a human face to it, which has made it more real for people. Though, thinking about that, I feel a little bit disappointed because the human impact should have been highlighted earlier in the year, right? Because there were people who were suffering from Chinese interference who weren't MPs. And I think that the impact that we're seeing with the Chong story highlights the fact that we didn't talk enough about the victims, the Chinese Canadian victims who were harassed by Beijing earlier in the year. We were so focused on the, uh, I guess, larger abstract questions of election interference that we neglected to talk about the human cost up until Chong became an issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do think that uh, uh, it was an issue. It seemed like it was going to be a, a very serious issue for for the Liberals, but they, they, they managed to throw enough shade on it that uh, people became slightly confused about who was telling the truth. And in that instance, they just dismiss it. They can't be bothered thinking about it. And, and, and so it looked like the whole thing had passed. And I do think that the Chong thing is much more easy to understand. And it's much clearer that the government <laughs> uh, neglected to take action uh, by not telling him two years ago. Let's finish with something Sabrina wrote this week. 
uh, the personal stake that many MPs, including the Housing Minister, Ahmed Hussain, have in keeping house prices up because they own rental properties. Uh, this was news to me, the extent of it, but uh, uh, Sabrina said one in three cabinet ministers supplement their salaries with investment in a rental income. The number of MPs is about 40%. It does rather suggest that they're merely paying lip service when they talk about uh, making housing more affordable, given that they're profit profiting from it uh, in the interim. Sabrina, can you elaborate? Uh, we've seen a complete failure by the Liberals to address housing affordability, despite it being the number one voter issue, certainly for the next generation and it having impacts across our economy uh, and impacts, I think, uh, on our social fabric as well and potentially our democracy. Uh, and when you see that such a high rate of MPs and cabinet ministers and the housing minister himself, who has bought two rental properties within the last two years at the height of the housing crisis, are literally invested in this issue continuing. Um, it does that, raise that's the very definition how motivated of, they are. That's the very, def very definition of tone deaf for the housing minister to do that, surely. Crazy. Absolutely. Um, and if this were any other industry, uh, if the fisheries minister bought a lobster fishing company or if the healthcare minister bought into a private uh, clinic, alarm bells and red flags would be everywhere. That would just be a non-starter. They would have to resign their post. But because housing is our national industry, uh, apparently our housing minister is allowed to have a personal and financial stake in the game where, again, for any other uh, area, this would be completely unacceptable. And so the, the flagship policy for the Liberals is this uh, first-time home buyer incentive where the government offers 10% uh, of the home's purchase price interest-free in exchange for a capped stake in the appreciation. Uh, the problem seems to be that they, there's a low take-up rate because in the most expensive markets, uh, the rules are too rigid. Uh, am I correct in that? Uh, yeah. Um, the maximum income that's allowed along with the maximum borrow rate is just, I mean, laughably low for the prices of housing these days. And combined with that, it's also a measure, though, that even if it did work, would stimulate demand and actually just set a new floor for housing prices. So it's a bad policy to begin with, and then on top of being a bad policy, it's failing to even do what it intended, which I think perfectly sums up the Liberals' approach to the housing issue. Uh, I wish that we had politicians who had more stake in the game. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful to see a housing minister who is a renter, who has actually suffered from this crisis, rather than one who is benefiting financially from it? Right, and it should be said that Pierre Poiliev is a, uh, rents a property too, and uh, we had a poll the other day that, that suggested the vast majority of people do not believe that he'll make any difference, despite the f number of times he, he uses the word gatekeepers. I'll throw that out there. But Adam, um, just closing it out, I mean, you, you're in the demographic that's most affected by, by these soaring prices. I mean, Vancouver is down, I think, 7% uh, from the highs of last year, but it's still up 25% in the last three years. Um, is this a big issue for you and your cohort? It is an enormous issue. Many people my age have given up any hope of buying a home unless they have rich parents or, you know, uh, <clears throat> they've lucked out in some other way. In terms of how it's affected me personally, I mean, I'm here in Ukraine reporting on the war, but I can't, you know, being transparent, it's nice not to have to pay such a huge chunk of my income to rent. And sometimes I wonder, uh, going back to Canada, what am I going back to? What kind of future can I build there? Getting some distance from Canada by being in Ukraine for the past year has given me perspective as to how warped and, and, and unsettling our housing market is. Uh, people find it wild in other parts of the world that you have no chance of buying a home if you don't come from a wealthy family. Right, right. I should ask, given the fact you're in Ukraine, what are you seeing on the ground? Is there, are there signs of uh, a counteroffensive? I wouldn't be able to say I just got back. I was seeing some family in Serbia, and I've been in Odessa for the past two days. So we're far enough from the front lines that I, I wouldn't right. be able to say conclusively. Right, right. Well, listen, it's been great to chat to both of you. Have a great weekend. We'll speak to you soon. Thanks, John. Thank you.